Good evening, everybody. I'm Rosemary Raven, and on tonight's continuing saga of the cities, we will focus our attention on the design critic's view of what makes cities work for people. You will recall that in last week's episode, architect John Jurdy stressed the importance to him of a co-creative, synergistic approach in the design process. Jurdy gave us a thoughtful talk and slide presentation, which included a quote, dazzling display of urban design, architecture allegories, festive decoration, sprightly coloring, and conspicuous commercialism, end quote, words written in an article from the LA Times recently in describing Jurdy's Horton Plaza in San Diego as, quote, populist postmodernism, end quote. We come now to the second episode of What Makes Cities Work for People. And taking the lead role this evening will be Sam Hall Kaplan, design critic of the Los Angeles Times and former chief editorial writer and assistant managing editor of the New York Post, and before that, urban affairs writer for the New York Times. Our speaker tonight is eminently qualified to comment on the subject of cities. He has written books and many, many articles published in such periodicals as Harper's Architectural Forum and Progressive Architecture. He has received numerous awards for his work, including the New York Times Publishers Award, New York City Parks Council Media Award, the Los Angeles Conservancy Award for writings on preservation issues, and most recently from the AIA and the APA, American Planning Association. This last one was the Journalism Award given to an individual journalist who is judged to have contributed outstanding coverage of city and regional planning and environmental concerns. I'd like to read briefly the citation that accompanied this award, for it tells you much more about Sam than anything I might say. This was the Journalism Award given to an individual journalist who is judged to have contributed outstanding coverage of city and regional planning. Sam Hall Kaplan, urban design critic for the Los Angeles Times, has made journalistic contributions to planning which are not limited to a critical review of specific building only, or even to a building in its setting only, or to the urban setting itself only. Rather, his articles focus on the social, political, and physical environment of the Los Angeles area. In his articles, he publicly reminds all who participate in the formulation of the physical environment that they are accountable for what they do. This accountability commends good design and condemns bad design. It also focuses attention upon the missed opportunities of nondescript design, which is probably even more important than anything else since it constitutes the largest single component of the urban environment. Sam Hall Kaplan's journalistic style is often breezy, upbeat, or provocative. His point of view is often personal, and his articles stem from first personal subjective experience of a building, area, or a street scene. His technique is not to do a series which concentrates on a specific issue, but to focus upon diverse issues and locations. That Mr. Kaplan has whetted the appetite of the average citizen to comment on the urban scene and reflect on his opinions is documented by the very large number of letters to the editor, letters devoted to lauding him or bawling him out. He does not go unnoticed. More importantly, however, while journalism cannot undo past environmental transgressions, the substantial response which has been generated among professionals and laymen alike, pro and con, makes it clear that Sam Hall Kaplan's commitment to the theme of accountability has succeeded in capturing the attention needed to influence future urban forms. And now, without further ado, I present Sam Hall Kaplan. And I thought that award was the Cal Hamilton Memorial Award. from the APA, of course. Um, just to dismiss that, um, uh, it embarrasses me a little to get it from the APA. One, 
I always see that. They hope to get a little coverage by that. But also the idea that we're going to have a national conference, the APA here, um, in April. And it was one of the reasons that our planning director said he would like to stay on uh, so he can address that. It would be a very embarrassing time for the city to have him talk if the city wasn't embarrassed enough by his errors of omission and planning, um, which um, I think are probably well beyond whatever indiscretions he exercised in office was that this city in the last 20 years in its amazing growth was a rising tide and it was a rising tide it's in, in a rising tide when you can make improvements not when things are receding and the improvements would be missed making to make this a better city for people I think that is what's criminal and um, what I try to do of course is hold these people accountable for it um, I think what they do is criminal um, cities and people with the series and I of course immediately want to correct that um, it's not cities and people it's cities are people for what are cities without people what are cities for anyway are they some sort of large canvas for a few ego involved architects to put up large buildings for what purpose for photographs or actually for people to live there work there take sun outside, collect garbage from, collect rent. That's what the city's all about. It's people. So you design for people, not buildings. Um, that's the sort of thing that gives it its throb, that makes it exciting. And that's what I'm going to, of course, talk about this evening. I'm going to show slides, a random selection, um, and comment on it. But I was supposed to, and I should follow the program, talk about cities and people I've corrected that cities are people and this gives me an opportunity uh, as a critic oh well, you know what is a critic um, paper keeps on changing my titles now design critic uh, it had been urban design critic they just then I wrote a piece about sea ranch 20 years later and they said that's not very urban that's rural and then uh, so they decided just to make it plain design critic Interesting about Sea Ranch, are, are we familiar with uh, 1960? You know, sometimes one of the problems I, I had to overcome, because I used to uh, be in the field, uh, is that I've become bilingual. <laughs> I speak to architects and I speak to the public, and often it's a completely different language and a different reference, and it's very important to keep in mind that I really write for a large public, estimated anywhere depending on where the articles go, three to five million people. Very few architects. And I'm writing for the general public. And it's a very important thing for them to understand. Uh, I don't write for the architecture or the design field. Um, I'm not their publicist in spelling a name right. I'm writing from the public point of view. Um, but uh, just on uh, Sea Ranch, and it was the marvelous design. So I went up to take a look at it, um, and I found, of course, the windows that were leaked, and this wonderful mine shaft architecture of, of verticals weren't working, and so they are now going to horizontals. Uh, because even though it won all these awards, it really didn't work particularly well over a period of time. I still think the code is in a very attractive community, and I wrote a piece about it. I'm going to talk about cities, but I just thought I'd mention that and why I'm now design critic and not urban design. Because I, occasionally I go beyond the city lines. Uh, finding out what a critic is, um, and it, uh, an opportunity like this allows me to define it. Uh, I often think of journalism, it's very exciting, very existential. You know, you live from one story to another. I, I don't even remember stories I've written. Um, it's sort of like jumping from stone to stone in a raging river. You know, you're never looking back. You're always looking at the next stone. And I'm worrying about, you know, what am I going to write next week? You know, can I find anything? God help me, anything upbeat. <laughs> Something, you know, that we can take some, you know. It's on um, uh, preview. It's on earthquakes. Um, and it's on um, the Huntington 
while they were bemoaning all this, of course, they were going out and hiring a land planner and finding out how they can do the 23 acres a little differently next to San Marino. And uh, my implication is, of course, is that a lot of developers and owners are using this opportunity of earthquake scare to um, make some changes that they normally wouldn't have made in landmark buildings and also perhaps break a few leases with tenants on Broadway and move out, kill the upper floors and move out the tenants that have been there for years and triple the rent. Um, that's called public-private partnership, <laughs> if you're wondering. Um, Chandler wrote, I'm a big fan of Raymond Chandler, um, you know, to write about a city, you have to love it or hate it or both. Um, and that's the way I feel. My perspective is a user. I, I live, work, shop, socialize, and for the most part play in the built environment. Uh, I have so for my entire life. Uh, I was born and raised in New York City. Uh, I spent time in Washington, D.C., London, Rome, and of course now here in that ultimate of 20th century cities, L.A. Uh, I love most cities, for better or worse. They are the sum of our civilization, the marketplace of materials, goods, services, and ideas. Um, it's, it's a marvelous thing. You, know, you talk about the city for all its problems, and I just wonder how many people here just want to move to the suburbs or be rural. The city is our tristorium. It's where people meet. You, it, it, it's a part of the whole urban human-animal breeding process. Uh, I once wrote a piece many years ago uh, with Charles Abrams, um, who was a city planner, and we talked about the city as a tristorium. It's where people are supposed to meet, they breed, and move out to suburbia to have their children, and they move back. It's sort of like it's a life cycle. Um, but the question is, letting does the city work? How does it work for people? Um, if I have to define the role of a critic, and happily Paul Hogue, a few months ago for the AIA architect, uh, Got not defined it for me, which is always very helpful. Uh, I, it's not to be the Howard Cassell of the built environment, though it, it might be fun, uh, but I do think of myself as an educator, uh, with all due respect to Ray uh, and the faculty here. Um, I try to put plans in perspective, define its goals, teach readers how to be more sensitive to design in their lives, expand the reader's vision, uh, show how they can better understand alternatives. In short, basically make them aware. Um, and again, I feel very responsible to my readers. Uh, not the architects, not the planners, and certainly not the public officials. Uh, if anything, I am a public advocate. Um, and may I be ethnic, which I am exceptionally ethnic, being first generation, and English being partially a second language. Uh, I always think of, of uh, the definition of a Jew, which was someone who couldn't sleep and wouldn't let anybody else. Um, I feel that is the proper role also of a critic. I can't sleep, um, and I won't let anybody else. Um, of course, I make judgments. What should shouldn't be written about? What lessons can be learned? Um, I'm not into isms. Um, I don't go to too many talks or exhibits to cover. Uh, I'm into things, show me, don't, don't tell me. You know, if you're, a mu if you're a theater critic, you don't have the playwright sitting next to you. If you're a music critic, you don't have the, the composer. God, most of them are dead. Um, so why should I have the architect? That building should read to me, that designer. Or why should I have the planner? The building should read for people. They forget who the architects are, but they don't get that experience. And of all the arts, architecture is an art. I'm saying this in these hallowed walls that have made a <laughs> made a fetish of it. Um, I always sometimes think they like to define architecture as an art only when the architecture doesn't work. Um, but I like to be. Don't tell me. Show me. And um, when I was teaching this this craft, I always used to say, I always work much better. Let's talk to the plans. God knows. I mean, just let's get the plans out and I can work on the tables and we can talk about the plans. So what I would like to do is just show some slides, see if I can work this. And um, 
comment on it. Uh, is there any way to turn that off? I'm sorry. Is there any way to turn? Is there any way to turn that off? Oh, can everybody hear me this way? No. Okay. Excuse me. Let me. Remember when engineering schools were called architecture schools? They never had this problem. Um, if you can turn that light off, because I'm not going to use, I don't have notes. And that, thank you. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Should I drink that? Um, <laughs> never accept water from a dock in an audience. <laughs> Could, could we turn that light off because that's hurting me? Um, and let's go to the first slide. Ah, cities are people. Uh, this is 42nd Street, Madison Avenue. And, and basically, uh, why I took this is, this is what it's all about. Um, oh my God. <laughs> I tell you, the journey practice is getting omnipresent. I didn't put that there. Is this left over from last week? <laughs> it was this last week's? So I wasn't here. I was, oh God, Jesus. I'm sorry, Deborah. Um, I'm sorry, let's get, that's it, back to people, thank God. So. <laughs> I thought that would wake up something. I, that was not from John's collection, and he's, uh, here we are. That's what we're talking about. Uh, all sorts of people. That's 47th Street. Here we are on Broadway, one of the more exciting streets, I feel, in LA, if, if not abused too much. And LA again. Uh, this is over on Santa Monica. Cities also are these focal points. You know you're in, guess the city. Of course, San Francisco, there's always a feeling that Transamerica Tower should have been in an LA. It's a more of an LA building, but I was never exactly sure what an LA building is. Um, and I think in that way, it, it, the city's very exciting, that it doesn't let the buildings read for it, it lets something else read for it. Uh, here is LA. God. It looks terrible from the top of the police station. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, now I will save that joke for later, talking about from the top of the police station. The best view, and I have a shot of, I was just doing a post-occupancy on um, the Portland building, Michael Graves, and the best view of it is from the, th uh, the uh, Fresca, Frasca, I think, that did a wonderful justice center across the street from a park in Portland. And the best view and the best shot of the Portland building, and the further you get away from the Portland building, by the way, the better it is, uh, is from the detention uh, exercise area uh, at the Justice Center uh, across the thing. And some people say that, of course, is the uh, penalty. <laughs> I like the building. I love it. I love that skin. And of course, why that was done, um, you know, uh, as we talk about symbols, everybody wanted a corner office. And it, it, it's, it's absolutely true. But of course, then we get into Sixth Avenue and the march of zoning and well-intentioned 1960s uh, zoning code by uh, changes by the city of New York. No matter what zoning code will ever be developed, I am always convinced that the former zoning officials who then become consultants and expediters will find a way to abuse it. It's an unending, an unending process. But of course, where the city is, of course, is on its street. Um, Lexington Avenue, the bread coming out in the morning. Um, I wonder, wonder how, I just took this last week. I didn't say, well, it's uh, not exactly Tim Street Porters. Um, Pike's Market, Fort, and if anybody read my column of last week, uh, a, a vicious battle to save that from the, all these well-intentioned center city people. And of course, now that it is saved, thank goodness, it's probably the most exciting place, at least I find, in, um, in Seattle, uh, the city government takes a great deal of pride in. And uh, here's another little marketplace. The city is a market. So we're talking about as focal points, and it's a market. 
Uh, this actually is always closed in the 14th century between the hours of 11 and 12, so people can mask and go out and have assignations. It's a marvelous place. But do you imagine this Venice, Venezia, coming across here in the uh, 14th century um, and coming across something as grand as this? Uh, spectacular. It, this is the exchange of ideas, things to lift the soul. Um, John, that's a journey who did the others, try this one on for size. This is, of course, the Galleria in Milan. Uh, you're really, I mean, it's just marvelous. And it is. Uh, Horton Plaza does have a place. Shopping, the whole shopping experience, the nature of the city is uh, to shop, to exchange goods, to service, to market, and to make these places exciting and, and people places. Uh, there is a great deal to say that our malls have become our main streets. And the question is, how do we improve them? You don't improve them with this. <laughs> this heavy, dark. Um, I, I find this one of the most disorienting buildings. Um, uh, I hate going inside. Um, I, tend, I don't. Um, uh, dark, uh, non-oriented. Um, and uh, built to the zoning code. Um, Zev said he couldn't stop it um, because that was the zoning. Uh, when I was downtown renewal director of New Haven in the 1960s, we always can find a way to stop an unfriendly building, even if it meant not just allowing curb cuts, little things. You're always a city convinced it can change, can do it. There was no reason why this could have been built the way it did, and by the way, in the process, destroy the economic base somewhat, it's coming back, of, of the Miracle Mile. Uh, this hurt Wilshire Boulevard terribly. It hasn't really recovered from it. Uh, the May Company has done a wonderful job, but this just sucked it away. Um, and it's this type of lack of planning that the city has allowed. It is this type of thing that I, I find deplorable. I, I get outraged easily. Um, here's something else. Another problem, I mean, it's not that I like or dislike uh, using common materials like, you know, say, you have to say it's Santa Monica. You didn't see a big say that said Milan Galleria on it, did you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and look how it works off the street. It, it's really, uh, inside I like what Frank has done. I like it skewed. It is, an interest, it is interesting. I understand there were a number of battles with the Rouse Company, but this, this is, I don't know, it's tacky, it's small, it's, um, oh well, God. Uh, the French. They've taken what really is a, 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 a sad development. This used to be the, the wonderful market they had made into a shopping center, but they've given it a little life, at least they've cut the points of, of access and egress through areas and have cluttered them up with tables and people and forcing that. Um, uh, it fights its way forward, to, you know, it overcomes what I feel um, too much of that French love of la shopping center. They're always, oh, this is, you know, talk about an upside down world, don't bother. This happens to be the Arco Plaza. And, you know, and I didn't put this in on it by mistake. Uh, I just threw it in. This is the entry. Here we are. 300 days of, 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 of wonderful weather. And what do you have? A hole in the ground. Um, God, shame. Oh, here's a market. Luca. Nice market. Looks great up there. I'd... And here we are again. Another marketplace. I just love these photos. So I just thought I'd just go and show that. This is um, Verona. Ah, buildings. Any place for sun. I don't want to absurd uh, Holly White, bless him, who um, has tried manfully to overcome the abuses of the New York City's uh, zoning, but anywhere, people will fight their way forward. They will find that sun. Just a little piece, any little area. Um, they will sit. Look at this, Rockefeller Center, a marvelous, one of the great pieces of design. 
this a terror? Not all plazas are good plazas. It's something I hope Arthur Erickson understands as he tries to s wrestle with California plazas scale, which I worry about. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with a few things I've seen, uh, but space does not necessarily, this is 43rd Street and 6th. Um, this is, thanks Cal, this is the Beaudry building. Um, actually, Gensler is doing some renovation inside, making this work a little better for the people inside. It will never, ever help the people on the outside. Built to the lot line, overwhelming, um, yeah, it's hard. I, you, just, you don't want to go downtown sometimes. Now, here's something that's working pretty well in an, an area I like. It's the Promenade Cafe. It's diagonally across from the Music Center. It's soft. It has some water in it. Um, it's an outdoor area that's becoming more popular. Um, and it has a certain scale. And it shows that public projects, privately designed, can work. They force this on the developer, uh, the CRA, and it's working. And uh, lends some hope. Whoops. Let's go back. Look at that. Doesn't it just want to make you sit there and look? That's Phoenix. If Phoenix didn't have enough problems as it is. Um, he tried. He tends to design his buildings upside down. Talk about upside down. This is 101 California, uh, and I, I really think has a, I, I don't know if I have the slide, has a wonderful facade, but coming to the ground, it has problems. I, I, I'm convinced that Philip Johnson does design from the top down. I just, and in, hopefully somewhere it meets at the bottom. Uh, it is an exceptionally important area of the city, done really badly. Um, a shame. Ah, here we are, Philip. Uh, here, Philip. Well, here we have the uh, famous pediment. Uh, um, you can't really notice it. It's high. I mean, it's got fantastic, again, from the top down, it's got fantastic press. It is an exceptionally well detailed building, done very well, but that's what you don't see. That's what you see. This is not done by trick camera. This is done with my little, you know, pocket 35. Uh, and that little rave down there is the. Uh, it is um, Psyox uh, screen here, earthquake ordinance. Um, you really, it's really is overwhelming on the street. I'd like the brickwork, but here again, what is it saying to the street? Uh, what is it saying to people? Um, it's nice they have the old AT and T, but it overwhelms the lobby. You feel very small. Um, look at this, nicely. Oh, look at that scale, but not not. And that's what happens. Everybody, by the way, is, a, is sitting across the street in Barnes's um, IBM building. It's inside, it's a garden, uh, it's a very friendly area. This is not a friendly area. Uh, but given the crush of Manhattan, it's amazing. I, I have hopes for it. And it is something that I, and one of our, I, why I have hopes for LA as well, that people tend to overcome bad design. If you have enough people out there say, oh God, let's sit. You know, on these, something. I just gotta sit. And so they sit. Um, Pioneer Square in Portland, I feel, for an area too open, too harsh, too hardscape. You know, you think it was done by Larry Halpern. Um, I mean, the whole thing is bricked over. Um, and, no, and very little water. At least Larry does exciting things with water. Uh, but people love it. It's open space, and they flock to it, and they appreciate it, and nothing like people overcoming open space. There was, and this is quite true, there was a real problem in renting the upper floors of Piazza San Marco for many centuries, because there just weren't enough people there. But eventually it caught on, and the upper floors rented well. <laughs> um, again, it's people. Um, even in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is the old post office. Um, I ran out lunch hour. They let me out. I'm an NEA juror for design arts. And uh, I think I, at that point, I was uh, zero for 16 on applications that I was in favor of, overwhelmed by the academics. 
wanting to write more papers, and no one wanting to do actual design solutions. <laughs> um, so I ran outside and actually saw this. This is the Nancy Hanks Plaza, and it's doing very well. God, even in Washington, D.C., they can. Uh, this is um, this is a, a little story, and I was telling Ray this one. Uh, the wonderful thing about coexisting uh, with, with cars and streets. This is not where this happened, but uh, I have an extended family in Rome. Uh, wars do wonderful things to families, uh, and we were coming there and having sort of a gathering. This is a couple of years ago, and. People were coming from different parts, and we families in uh, above an area known as Trastevere, it's Monteverde Nouvelle, uh, and we had a little restaurant we went to down in this old section. And what happened was, uh, of course, it was Saturday night, and it was September, and it's Rome, and it's crowded. But they said, "Well, don't wait, wait. We'll put a table." And they waited. We waited until a car pulled out, and they put a table out in the street. <laughs> And we waited again, another car, and eventually, as two people showed up, we basically, the tables took over the street, and the pedestrians took over what was the street during the day. It was made much like this. We just forced our way out. Cars drove up by you. But there is, you know, there's no reason why cars can't exist if they know their rights and responsibilities and they respect people. I mean, one of the problems, one of the many problems of the Third Street Mall, uh, not the least of it is the city itself and its, and its false programming, but it is its scale. Would have Third Street be better? This is in Santa Monica if indeed it was a street and cars still can go down there? Would it be more exciting? Could we have done something? I don't know. I don't think mauling things necessarily is the answer. I think it comes to programming and it comes to attitudes. And you can use both streets. It's a, um, there is a uh, various programs in Europe um, in terms of separating streets. And as a matter of fact, uh, Beverly Hills is going to be trying some of those in an experiment. Good for Beverly Hills. This, what we should not do. Of course, this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, this is the Pedway system. Pedway uh, basically abandons the street. It's an, it is a, a gesture saying, no, we give up. The cars of one um, uh, push us up. So even if those were bridges of size, or uh, Ponte Vecchio, or something of, 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 of really interest, uh, I think it's uh, uh, a moral victory not to give in to those. That the streets are for people. Cars can exist. The street's too wide anyway. Should be one way. They should narrow it. Uh, when I was fighting for uh, some street trees. Uh, they, the city was on, on flower. The city was said it was going to lose money if it, if, if it didn't use this up. And, but I checked with some government official, and, and basically you could use the money to widen streets or to narrow them. No one ever thought of that idea. Uh, this happens to be the Hamburger Hamlet, a little, one of the busiest corners in the city, flower and seven, sixth, uh, and seventh. Uh, a, even a, an amendi, God bless them. Uh, you can sit there. And this is what they wanted to narrow down even further. This is after I had fought. They did it because the contracts had given out. This is what a city exists for, to give out contracts, not to make it. They w took off a little half foot. Those branches have been broken. They're squeezing the roots. Uh, they, but they got their little contract, and they did their little favors. Um, it was a Pyrrhic victory. I don't know how long those trees will last. Those are three or four trees I fought for. Spent much more time and energy and paper and inches and ink on that than some of the more sometimes interesting. Um, I'm talking about some of the private houses, the designer gene houses that have done out of here uh, that do do some interesting things with materials and concepts, but in the scheme of things, I've felt are somewhat irrelevant. I think saving for trees and devoting space to it is more important than walking the back alleys of Venice and seeing if someone has done someone's addition um, so the shadow can work right. It's a question of values. Pedestrians prohibited. Look at that. This is Flower Street again. And you know, you laugh, and I, but you know, there's something pervasive. It wears you down. Uh, what's in the minds of these people, 
want, you know, uh, to do this. This is what happens there. Of course, they couldn't widen the street, and they always have the jog. And you know, uh, that you know, that's my little thing. I save that end there, and you know, I just wish those Department of Transportation people down the have to pass there every day. You know, just to see that. There's something about, I, I, you know, if I was a, uh, if I was a Freudian or Jungian psychiatrist, I would say something's wrong. Why they always want those straight lines about engineers. Um, but the whole battle, of course, was so a car could make a left-hand turn lane, a left-hand turn from this, so they would cut down those trees and widen the streets. We've got a left-hand turn lane mentality. And here, hey, interesting building, great. Look at that street. Uh, just uh, doesn't work particularly well. But what does work, of course, uh, this is taken a number of years ago, ruined my father's old neighborhood um, in the Marai, but it works exceptionally well, and it's a people place, it's an open, it's a little too open, it fills up. Uh, the interesting thing, I don't know if you've been there right, recently, but a wonderful Museum of Modern Art, the Pompidou Center, it's on the, they now have it, I think it's free four or five days a week. They were not drawing people, even though the center was the most pop, more popular than Notre Dame, more popular than the Louvre, no one was going to the museum. They basically were going to see other people. They were just going out because it was a place to hang out. And uh, all the, uh, uh, the people just basically the metro, this is where the kids hung out. It was there, it, it, it do hang out. And now they've made the museum free just to attract people in there. Um, God, we try. We put up a little piece of sculpture, and at least the, you can sit on those benches. Uh, um, what would a couple of vendors do out there? Uh, make it much more exciting. Oh, this is, uh, I, I, I threw this in. This was, uh, it was an AIA convention. Uh, here we have, this is Long Beach. Big hotel, new convention center, and this is the way you get from the hotel to the convention center. <laughs> Seriously, that's the way you walk. I don't know, anybody go to that convention last year? And we say, that's where I walk back and forth to the hotel. Did you walk by there? Hey, that's wonderful. Look at the detailing and the treatment to that. <laughs> you know. Now, you know, we're going to, I'm going to have to say the word now. We're talking contextualism, right? Now, that's the hot word. My feeling on that is, you know, there is, you know, what is, there's no reason when you're designing in a context that you can't improve it. <laughs> you don't have to mimic it. It's okay. Now, here we are, downtown, very exciting area. Um, this happens to be on First Street going to Little Tokyo. And where fr frontage down there is so expensive. I mean, you're dealing with $150 a square foot, and what does the city put up? You imagine if that was a row of retail for energetic little Tokyo businessmen, what they could do to that, how much more interesting it would be walk to walk by? My God, you know, and you wonder why the homeless just want to stand there and urinate. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they may not have a few million readers, but they, can, they too can be critics. <laughs> but, but it's those little things, these opportunities. Why can't, by the way, that's Cal Hamilton wanted to extend this, widen the street by ripping down all the north side of First Street from Maine on. So they can just widen that street as an alternative. I mean, it just, it was fought off. But, but meanwhile, look at this opportunity. Look at that. And uh, that garage, it's, uh, this is what I talk about opportunities. This happens to be, you know, you can't have, hey, you can do streets on, say, hello, handicapped. <laughs> this is Laguna Beach. Someone took me around. Oh, look at this. Isn't this nice? Nice texture and woods and all. God, you know. Uh, here's my neighborhood. This, Santa Monica. Look at this, mooning the street. Here you got a wonderful alley system that these thing, these garages should be off and they give curb cuts to. And 
while we're getting into these little things and why this is important, hey, look, a little curb cut. This is, happens to be jogging across the street, 21st in uh, California. Uh, this is what I really feel is important. No more macro plans. Someone was mentioning Cal, well-intentioned, came here, had goals, committees, great big plan. No, forget it. There are some guidelines, yes, but where planning and where it makes a difference in the city is you're walking right along that street. It's those little details. It's those details that change the nature of your experience. I mean, here is my back alley, which I wrote a piece on. Uh, someone's putting flowers up there, and I think that was done by a CRA planner, Terry. Yeah. But here is just back to those little micro planning. While Santa Monica spent, you know, a quarter of a million dollars on a plan that really sets out uh, some very vague and, and questionable goals, why can't they just do something if, since you've allowed all those curb cuts on the major streets and have destroyed the frontage, it's hard walking along that, and everybody works off the back streets, why can't someone do something in the alleys? A little demonstration, close off one end. Uh, just to diminish the traffic, which, by the way, now flows off into alleys. Um, uh, try some plantings. Try just cleaning it once in a while. You know, we wait till the Santa Ana's blow. Um, and, but that's the city. And, you know, everybody comes out there and talks in that alley. Um, you know, that's where I pick up my gossip from the CRA. That's what I hear. There's someone else who works for the uh, Rent Control Board. You hear a lot of funny stories about that. Um, but that's the nature. Why? Because no one ever meets out in front of the street anymore. You can't. Cars are coming up and down the part of this. Is, you know, that's it. Look at that. It's, this is a front. They, there's, a, there's a back alley here. No, but they allowed that off the front and let the cars park on it. I mean, where is the sensibilities? Here's another one. An award-winning building here at 28th Street. Solar houses, I think it was. I forgot the name of the architect. Uh, I try to block these things out. Hey, reads well, interesting. Look at this walkway. Imagine going up to a unit this way, a welcoming door to, you know, sidle past. Hey, they got lighting, fine. But to sidle past that to gain access. Well, I'm not asking for this. This happens to be 42nd Street. Uh, the game's out on the street. This, of course, will all be cleaned up as soon as. Um, um, uh, Johnson's plan is implemented. New York is a very funny place, and I wrote seven years, eight years in the New York Times, and I always thought of the developers there, a very strong real estate community, much stronger than here. And East Midtown uh, was where a tremendous amount of development goes on, and the, the developers are always pictured as sort of tigers in a cage. And a mayor would say, oh my God, they're getting hung, and then back and forth, pacing back and forth, and say, here, here, throw them East Midtown. <laughs> and they open up the cage, throw in East Midtown, and they chew it up, and you know, they sit there sated for about 10 years. And then, you know, they spit out a bone or two, and they say, oh my God, they're, re Arr, they're restless again. They're moving back and forth, and says, here, take 42nd Street, choke on this one. And, you know, they throw them a whole neighborhood. You know, you get a feeling that's also done here. Oh, God, new campaign coming up? Getting a little restless, pushing here. Give them Northwestwood Village. You know, <laughs> throw that one in. Destroy the scale, destroy the market, destroy everything that makes it attractive. Oh, too bad. What's next? Sawtell. Hey, not bad. You know, you see what's happening. Um, it's, uh, hey, where's that Olympic spirit? <laughs> Yeah, tree planting in Santa. This is West Hollywood. They had these wonderful flags. They had, this was taken a couple of ways. They had wonderful flags there. They cleaned it up for the Olympics. Uh, but, you know, in the process, um, you know, West Hollywood's a little more concerned to getting uh, equal rights to, in, at bars to creating a fairly decent environment for its residents who were out on the street. Hey, if you're going to cruise Santa Monica Boulevard, at least have a nice place to do it. Why worry so much about the bars? Look at that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got a $100 million profit from the Olympics. Uh, this happens to be a half a block away, the ITT Plaza, 46th Street, between 6th and 5th. Really a very nice little area, but just, just 
give anybody some space so they can sit anywhere, uh, it, people will do it. Here's an old landmark. I didn't. This was taken uh, before uh, Marcel Breuer. Um, uh, this is at the Whitney, and that, of course, is not my photographs. It is. They are. That is my photograph, and it was in focus. Um, God, if I get a little more out of focus, um, I can sell it to the Times. <laughs> No, they would say, hey, there's a blank space up in the right-hand corner. Let's burn on someone's picture as an inset. <laughs> God, it's sometimes embarrassing. Yeah. Well, uh, here is, uh, Breuer did not, it is a singular building uh, for Madison. It is not a very inviting building. This, uh, this happens to be that fence. They kept on doing some public art down in that hole. At that time, there was a lot of tires in it. But people will manage because there are a lot of people. Where else is there to sit on it? Um, I don't know if, I don't, what little I've seen of, of Graves' new plan for it, I don't think he improves it that much. Uh, no. This was just thrown in because God knows, I had one of, of Horton Plaza. I had to have one for Deborah Sussman. <laughs> this is just basically balancing off the two. Oh, I do want to keep those two happy. Um, yeah, so you can show one, show the other. There, there's the colors. Thank you. Okay. Um, is this public private partnership? Uh, spikes so no one would sit on their wall, God forbid, and be comfortable. People will persevere. Uh, street details, nice, hey, so you're mixing up, you know, it's not exactly the way uh, Rate Sasaki would do it, but it's something. And this, I, as I showed the class here, this is, of course is Broadway in front of McDonald's. Um, you can tell it's Broadway because of the, um, the uh, scrap, piece of scrap paper that hasn't been cleaned up. Uh, talk about street amenities. May they rest in peace. <laughs> oh, that, that, by the way, is the Pissoise of Paris, which I always found um, very appealing. Uh, just in case, that's it. And uh, it's my uncle. Even then, I... Here's an interesting part. Public process. Uh, three buildings. Um, the GT&E building at the left, all built within the same zoning, all built with a different program, all diff under different administrations in Santa Monica, and just showing you the difference. GT wanted, the city wanted a symbol, a large building, and I think, who did that? Beckett or? Dim Jim. Actually done very nicely, and it, it does say something to the Shangri-La, it has that little updated modern look to it, curved. Everybody hated it. That's the thing that created the Santa Monica, Santa Monica City Architectural Commission. So what did they come up with? Something a little longer. They came up with Champagne Towers. I mean, outrageous. Then you had the Coastal Commission. Let's create a little park. Let's do a little step back. These are all dic publicly dictated designs. Um, and of course, you have one of the worst places for food, but one of the best places for a view the Cafe Casino, which is the number three business in, in terms of generating retail sales in Santa Monica. They do a slam bang business. It's a, they keep on expanding. Uh, you know, um, people love it. It's a, it's a great area. Uh, you know, you, if you can tolerate the food. Um, and to think of that, the developer fought this. God, we gotta make a park at the corner. You know, those goddamn socialists. You know, got to do a thing. Got to, got to do a park. And then they said, "Hey, you can't have a bank. You know, we got to have some sort of retail." And they gave them a cafe casino. It's the biggest renter now. It's their greatest lease. You know, it's wonderful. Uh, certainly a little more attractive than this street again. That was down the street. Ah, uh, this is the thing that makes you sad. I, I mean, it really—it just—it rips at me. I, I can, this is the L.A. River. Running a series. Do you imagine a river going through a city? What an amenity. Look what San Antonio's done. My God, look what Phoenix and Scottsdale, of all places, that hotbed of, of conservatism, done with their rivers. 
What have they done with uh, true, what have they done with the saying? Uh, and this is what we've done. We've turned our back to it. We've made it into a ditch. Um, and it's these opportunities uh, that I see as missed opportunities. Imagine planning. Imagine what a how. I mean, they cost a hundred thousand dollars more in Westlake since you're facing water. True, this water is. Oh, but what can you do when you, there are things you can do to make this attractive. Why can't that be grass? Why can't that be a, a, a green slice through the city, not just washing to the water? And this is the nature of LA. This is the nature of, of, of lost opportunities that I was talking about. Ah, they wanted to fill this one in. This, of course, is Venice. Um, and it was stopped. They left three of the, what, dozen canals. Um, and here's a little public art. This is, oh, well, this is Pioneer Square in Portland. Uh, the real gesture, of course, being Portland, very humorous. Someone put an umbrella out. This is one of the few days it didn't rain. That's my problem with the place. It's too open. But even in the light rain that's always falling on Portland, uh, always seems to be, uh, people use it because it's an open space. It's also a city that invites pedestrians. Another little pedestrian amenity of Portland. Just wondering, I was there a couple of weeks ago. Ah, here we're talking to about Michael's building on the park. Not bad from a distance. Uh, hey, here's his San Juan Capistrano. I liked it. Sort of works. Sort of public entrance is a little bad um, for a public building. So what's wrong with this? A little decoration. Uh, all those little dark windows. Nothing like this is a sunny day. They had two last year in Portland. And the sun, these are dark windows. I'm doing a post-occupancy on this. Those are dark, so you never know that one day it's light in, San, in, in Portland. You don't know, because those windows are dark. Um, and there are fake windows on that as well. It is decoration. He had a very tight budget. Uh, but this is what goes on on a street. Not that I'm against, not that it looks sort of like a municipal bath with a tile, How can, but this is the street on the park. This is a park, a major park across the way, and what is the entry? The people who walk through that from the public parking who work in that building cross the park and enter walking into that public garage, which is the only real entryway on that, and up a back stairway past the garbage to get in. On a park, imagine doing that on a park. Yeah, I mean it's just uh, it's, that's a, okay. I knew this had to come up. <laughs> Talking about decoration, and I'm just doing this to save the questions that I usually get. I think, and, and I'm, I'm saying this for the record, not because I just walked by there again today, uh, but it is, I feel, one of the most exciting buildings in LA. What he has done to take the component parts and to break it down, what is the nature of a building, and take those parts and show in pieces is exciting. That he couldn't put them back together again, <laughs> exactly right, is really quite secondary. Architecture needs, and I'm saying this, architecture does need, God, it's devoid of ideas. And he is challenging the whole concept of the box. And I think for that, Frank should be congratulated. But in doing it with these common materials, he does not respect the materials. That's that sheet metal, the, 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 <clears throat> the uh, plywood doesn't do anything. It does not weather well here. He forces it into strange geometric shapes that do, are not consistent with their low cost qualities. And it just, the idea is there, the execution is not. Uh, I just, for the record, you're interested in working with low-tech materials? Hey, you want to build a house for $20 a square foot? Hey, that's okay. Not everybody can get someone in Beverly Hills and Roxbury to spend a million and a half for, you know, four or 3,000 square feet. You can get Roger Walker to do it. Now, he, this, is in, this is in New Zealand, I was there last year. Hey, you want sheet metal? That works. He doesn't push it. He doesn't cut it at, a, at an odd angle. He doesn't take the plywood and cut it, cross-cut it. He works with it. 
Any artist understands their materials and their limits to it. Roger Walker is an artist. And he did this too, marine plywood. He did a little Disney house. It's a f nice place. People seem to like it. The apartments re-rent. Um, this is done in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, cheap materials, really. And the way he did it was, again, a uh, consistent use of working with the materials, not against the materials, to force arbitrary shapes for the sake of art. Um, I think architects have an obligation to fight that box, to understand it, to take it apart, break it up, skew it, do it what you will, but the ultimate obligation, of course, is to make it work. Hey, this is hot stuff, too. Uh, Bowfields, public housing. Big statement, tremendous press. Uh, outside of Paris, do you want to live there? Is this something that you want to make? I mean, you just look back at this low-cost housing and that low-cost housing. He was more interested in making a statement. Here again, is the city a canvas for you to play with, or is it something to serve the people? A little overpowering. You know? To say this is an improvement upon public housing of Chicago because it has some sort of arch? No. Here's something. Right here, Vista Montoya. Well scaled, modestly detailed. It can work. It can make people feel good. It can come in at a reasonable cost. We don't have to force it to its limits. We don't have to take type 5 construction and make it jump backwards. Um, and here's something very exciting. Uh, it's the, uh, my other photo didn't come out well. This, of course, is uh, the new Museum of Contemporary Art downtown. An exciting building. Made all the more exciting, I think, because of the nature of California Plaza and Erickson's somewhat sterile buildings. Um, but it has a texture to it and it has a warmth and a light. And, and it doesn't fight it. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to that. Helmut Jan, playing with his little buildings, doing his monuments. Uh, Hans Holine. I think this is left over from another lecture. This is his new museum. Nicely material, nicely scaled. This is Chicago again. God, big. Big city, big shoulders. Now, it used to be a city of big shoulders, I thought now it's a city of big feet. <laughs> All these foot marks. Nice. M nice skin. This is Crocus Center. Uh, I think one of the m better executed buildings. Um, it's interesting how that plays against, now Erickson's building now plays against it, if you've seen that recently. Here we are. More March of the Towers. This is the city. The city is landmarks too, the Flatiron Building. I was wanted to match this against, try to get the angle of, of SONM's Crocker Center. I mean, you can enjoy building. I mean, cities are more than just people. Yeah, they are buildings and, pe and they do have histories and they can be enjoyed. Um, Tokyo, Shingushu, in the evening. Um, God, I took my life into my hands doing this one. <laughs> uh, cars, people, a vibrant city. The size of San Francisco, only uh, 10 times as dense. Um, here's a little bit of open space, which we need and breathe. The library. Uh, that's what I was going to talk about. I mentioned it earlier, the Sheridan, the need for our landmarks, how they fall apart, uh, fall under avaricious development. Uh, it would be a shame. I hope it stays. I hope the city can fight it. The city needs buildings like this. It remind them of their past, a sense of place. And when you have a sense of place, a sense of history, you have a sense